I'm so much, I'm so happy to get out of my stilettos, you don't know. <laughs> These stages are like standing on concrete for three days, they're a killer. Doesn't matter if you wear slippers, your feet will still hurt. Anyway, so now we're going to go through, you've got your development application approved, now steps in kick num step number seven, which is the actual renovation process. And for me, guys, this is my all-time favourite step. Um, this is what I truly love. This is where my true heart passion is, is being on site, renovate, undergoing the renovation process every single day. So what I'm going to teach you now over the next course of a couple of hours, we're going to break for lunch in uh, fairly soon. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go through how you set up your sites, basically how you project manage your sites like a professional professional from start to finish. We're going to go through how you manage your tradies, get them working at peak performance, um, basically how you're very organised on site. So how does that sound? All right, good. Now, everything I'm going to show you in step number seven, um, it's all about project management. People think, oh, project management sounds complex. You need a university degree for that. You absolutely don't. Um, this is some simple things, um, simple things that I do in my day in, day in, day out on my site that has helped me be very, very organised and keep my sites running smoothly. So what this process is all about is obviously how to professionally establish your sites because there are certain requirements that you as professional renovators will need to comply by just to make sure that your sites are safe sites so that none of your workers on site get killed, okay? Um, also, what tools are required to be an efficient project manager and basically how you find and find your, your tradies and get them working at peak performance. Now, firstly, start speaking the, the language of a renovator. No longer you refer to your properties as my home or my address. What you should start saying is my site address. So when you ring up your suppliers and you say, I'd like to order five lengths of four by two, you know, the site address is. When you, when, when you ring other suppliers, you talk to your architects, when you want your architect to come out, when you're briefing them, oh, the site address is 93 Hill Street, okay? So don't say my house. Because when you say my house, it puts you back into weekend warrior mode, okay? So there's certain lingo, certain li um, lingo of this industry, okay? And you need to start talking it. Okay, so what we're going to do now, first of all, before we start getting in all the site establishment stuff, we need to go in and do a little bit of project pre-planning. So when you sign the contract of sale, um, basically let's assume that you're going to do a cosmetic reno or a structural renovation, um, pretty much you need to start preparing your construction project plan. Now, I've done a template for you in this regard. So you've actually got these. <laughs> I went crazy in step number seven on templates. I overdosed big time and I'm not finished. Um, so what you want to do is you want to grab your project plan. So I've done your project plans for you. Now these are based in Microsoft Project. The shell is already there. Obviously every project, um, everybody's project is going to be different in one shape or form. So what you actually do is you just basically delete whatever lines aren't applicable and you basically insert whatever lines are missing. I will get to a stage at some stage that I'm actually going to do, I'm going to spend some time, don't ask me when, but it's on my to-do list um, where I'm actually going to do these as modules and you can actually insert the modules into your project plan. So I think that would be much better, but I just it's on my to-do list list. So at some stage you'll get that. Just don't ask me when. Okay. So use the time after exchange. So as soon as you secure the property, first thing you want to do is you want to start updating your project plans, okay? So use Microsoft Project to do that. And what you want to start doing is utilise that time before settlement to start shopping for your, your appliances. You know that from step number three, you would have gone through and you would have done your property inspection checklist. So you would have been going through the property. You would have had your property inspection checklist done back from step number three. Do you know what I'm talking about? You're all with me? Okay. And you would have, as you went through and looked at the floor, the walls, the ceilings, you would have noticed that, okay, you're in the kitchen. You need to buy a new cooktop, you need to buy a new oven, you need to buy a new range hood, you need to buy a door handle for that room. So from that property inspection checklist, this is going to feed back and determine your shopping list. Now what you want to avoid on your renovation sites, particularly if you're going to project manage your own sites, okay, as a structural renovator or a cosmetic renovator, you want to try and minimise not being off-site, okay? Because if you want to get the reality is if you want to get in and do them very quickly, i.e. in two weeks, like you all have the capability to do a cosmetic renovation in two weeks. I know it sounds ludicrous at this point in time, but cosmetic renovations are very quick, very easy to do. So what will happen is you'll do an insane and intense amount of work in a very short period and you'll have lots of tradies coming in. So it helps if you're not, if you're actually on site during that, on site always during that two weeks, not off site. Now you can waste a lot of time going and shopping, shopping around at Harvey Norman, good guys, tile shops. You can waste a lot of time off site. You could spend the whole day off site 
doing that. Um, so if you can use that, utilize that time, like you know you need a stove, a, a range or a cooktop, do all of that before work actually starts on site. Also, when you're dealing with some suppliers like your cabinet maker for your kitchens, the first thing they're gonna wanna know is they'll say, Cherie, where's the specifications for your, what cooktop are you putting in? What range hood? What's the size? Is it a 600? Is it a 900? Because they can't design their cabinets until they've actually got your appliance specs. Because they're basically gonna cut around and, and suit the cabinets to suit some of those appliances. So can you see how it would actually delay? That would mean if you weren't prepared, like if you weren't utilizing that settlement period, you'd have to say, oh, okay, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll go and get the appliances and I'll come back to you in the next day or so with what appliances, what model numbers. So if you can utilize that pre-project that pre -project where you haven't actually got the keys yet, that is the perfect time to start doing all of your shopping. So what you do is you go to the suppliers, you choose your models, and you basically ask for the, you know, the, the product specification sheet which has got all the diagrams on it. You ask for that and you give that to your cabinet maker. Okay, where possible, um, in a lot of instances, you are um, vendors where you've bought a property, they will allow you to bring some of the bigger trades into quote as well. So if you want to get a head start on your renovation so that the day you start is the day your cabinet maker comes in, if you've got a good vendor, they will let you come in and typically um, get tradies into quote for certain sort of things. So you might be able to get the floor sanders in, you might be able to get the cabinet maker come in and just basically check measure rooms, all that sort of stuff. So. Always ask the questions. Don't assume you can't get it. You can get it if you ask, but not always with every single vendor. Okay. Um, also, what you want to do is you want to be in a position where in that six weeks, I'm just assuming a standard six weeks settlement, you sign the contract, you settle in 42 days. Obviously, some other states are going to be a little bit different in that regard. But what you want to do is you want to try and line them up. So what I aim for is I know if I'm starting work on the 14th of August, I'll line my, my basically my guys who are going to do the strip out for me. I'll organise my cabinet. So if I'm starting on the 14th of May, oh, my board. Um, <laughs> if I'm starting on the, it looks good, but not very practical. So if I'm starting on the 14th of May, I'll have all my guys, like two or three guys in doing strip out, because that typically takes a day on a low budget cosmetic reno to get everything stripped out. And then I'll have my cabinet maker in on the Tuesday, basically starting to check measure or the plaster is in, whatever it may be. So I line them up day, back to back so that um, one finishes and the next person's in. All right. So in an ideal world, your objective as renovators is to start work the day you settle, okay? All right, these are the project management tools you're going to need to be an effective project manager on your site. As I said, very simple tools, very simple tools that will make you highly effective project managers. So the first one is Microsoft Project. Now, who uses Microsoft Project at the moment? Okay, Microsoft Project is absolutely fantastic. Um, you know, even if you don't want to renovate, you can organise your parties and Christmas gigs, whatever, right? You, this, is n this, is pro this is not construction project planning, it is project management software. The beauty with so, the plans that I've done, if you don't have this um, software installed on your computer, you won't be able to open the construction plans because they're based in Microsoft Project. Now this cost, uh, who's bought this recently? Anybody bought this recently? I get, keep getting told conflicting stories, but um, if you buy the full version of this, it's about $1,100. Um, so it's expensive, but it's very good software, but it's expensive. And then we, we're able to get the academic version through Renovating for Profit because we're technically an education company as well. So we can pick it up for about $200, um, which is, it's not the full version, it's the academic version. So we actually used to give this, um, not give it away, we used to um, sell this at cost price at our previous workshops. Uh, and then we stopped doing it. But is there anybody interested? Because we have to order like a minimum of 100. Um, so, okay, so we've got a fair few people that are interested in buying it. So if you're interested in buying it, can I just ask you to send an email to the office in the course of the next couple of days and I'll order, I'll order 100 sets of that in. So obviously that's a big chunk of expense um, for us. But we'll pass that on to you at cost price, which uh, I think it was about $185, $200, somewhere around there. So uh, for Max, oh. I don't know. I have to order 100. I know that my minimum order quantity to get those rates, I have to order a minimum of 100. I won't, I won't have the, the volume to order 100 of Macs, unfortunately. But you can get a PC, you know, the PC Mac conversion kit. 
So, your construction project plans, make sure you update these. The beautiful thing with Microsoft Project is that if you update it, if, for example, Tony the bricklayer is sick on a Monday, he's due to start work on Monday, and he's at home vomiting his, his stomach up, and he just can't get to your site, you only change that one line, and it automatically updates every other single line in the program instead of you having to go through and do that manually. So it's really good software. Now, this project management plan, this is what's going to keep you on time because you're going to be reviewing this and see where you're tracking according to schedule. If you don't have documents like this, very good chance that your construction, your reno is going to slip from six weeks to 10 weeks. Okay, that's reality. This is also a key document that gets given to your tradies as well. So when Tony the bricklayer is starting on my site on Monday, as part of his briefing pack, which I'll go through with you, I get to grab a yellow highlighter. I highlight his lines of responsibilities. So Tony clearly knows what day he needs to be on site and what he'll be doing on that day. Okay, so it's, it's quite good in that respect. Okay, trade directory. Now, one of the templates that I've actually set up for you is a trade directory. Remember I said that you're going to need to start um, forming two teams. One is your trade team, one is your consultant design team. So I've created lots of templates in that regard for you. Now, you've got two trade team directories. You've got one which is general tradies. So this is called the trade directory. And this is where you basically can enter the details. I find it just easier to write into this sort of stuff, but you can, um, this is an editable uh, document if you want. So start compiling numbers of tradies, your bricklayers, paint la um, painters, concreters, form workers. So when you see a utility drive zooming past you on the highway, what are you going to do? Trace him. No, you're going to basically record their number. So quite often tradies advertise their mobile number and their services on their utes and their trucks. So get into the habit now of keeping a pen and paper in your car. Even to this day, I have hundreds of tradespeople in my mobile phone. And even to this day, if I'm sitting at the traffic lights in the morning and some concrete truck pulls up next to me with some, you know, concreters or form workers, I will still write their name down because the reality is sometimes your tradies go off the rails and good tradies once were good tradies and something happens and they don't, they just suddenly become bad tradies. I'll give you an example. My fencer used to be an absolutely brilliant fencer that I've worked with for the past seven years. Um, and then he had had an accident and he chopped his finger off with the saw. And from that point forward, he was never the same person. Um, and it was so much in fact that, um, you know, I referred him to one of my students uh, not knowing this. And, you know, that trade person like threatened to kill one of my students. So and I'm like, well, that's totally out of character. So I don't know if, whether he was the cause or whether it was my student, but... Um, <laughs> You know, sometimes people change. That's the reality. So sometimes, you know, tradies that were once your favourite suddenly become um, just you don't you use you stop using them, or you find somebody better. That's the reality. Continuous improvement. So what you want is you want a smorgasbord of tradies at your disposal for a rainy day. If Tony, your favourite bricklayer, is not available, you want to go to tradie number two in the bricklayer section, okay? So the more numbers you have, the less time, the more effective you're going to be. What you're going to do on site, guys, is that what I recommend you to do is, um, and I almost created a new folder for this, but I thought I've got to stop giving out things. Um, I was going to create a site management folder, another folder for your site management. And what I would strongly suggest is that you have a lot of these templates in step number seven actually just in your folder. So when you start a new project, put a fresh set of new templates in your site management folder. It's just going to be a simple folder like this, fresh set of templates, and that way you've basically you can record everything. Because there's going to be a lot of ingoings and outgoings on coming onto your site, like deliveries, tradies. You really should record what tradies are on site, when and when they leave, all those sorts of things. Things, okay, so if you have one site management folder, start inserting some of these things. Okay, construction site diary. As a project manager, you need to record what happens on the site. And the way that I do this is via my construction site diary. It's a diary that you get for about 12 bucks from Officeworks, just your normal sort of thing. Don't even think about guys using iPods or um, iPads and all that sort of stuff on a construction site. It's not really the best thing in terms of dust. Um, so what you want to do is I just find that the good old fashioned, um, you know, diary where I just write notes. So I'll pass this around so you can all read it. This is from... Um, a project last year, I think it is. And so, you know, I'll just read out some things. You know, here, like paid hookies roofing, um, 17,000. 
um, you know, paid Tony Briggs. So obviously today I was paying all the invoices. Um, Jake went home at 1 p.m. PM. We saw back. Crystal Pools cancelled work on site due to rain and site wet. Matt came out to inspect ground, said he would call me back but didn't. Um, so I make all those little, so when he comes back and says, well, Sheree, you never got back to me, I'll say, well, I actually rang you on Tuesday, Monday, the 19th of March, and I left a message, you never got back to me. So I, I just record all those sorts of details. Um, I'll give you one example. One day, so you can see here, like, your construction site, Doris, so quite often I'll estimate quantities of tiles, like if I'm about to, if I know I need to go and buy some tiles on site, um, I'll measure quantities, I'll keep them in my construction site, Dory. otherwise you end up with a thousand pieces of paper and the one you're looking for you can never find. And um, so, you know, sometimes uh, <coughs> just all sorts of things. I'll, I'll tell you an example, um, one of the, uh, where this is particularly useful. One of my tradies submitted an invoice at the end of the week for five days' work, and I said to him, it was for the week before, and I said, Tony, you didn't actually work five days last week, you only worked four. And he goes, no, I worked five days, should he? And I said, you actually only worked four, Tony. And he goes, no, I've got it in my diary and that I worked five. I said, go grab your diary, I'll have a look. And so he went and grabbed his diary, and he wrote, pimble, pimble, like he just literally wrote, pimble, 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 at the, type, at the side of, on, his, on his diary. And I said... Okay, so I went back to my diary and I said, the site was closed on Tuesday. Last Tuesday, the site was closed. And he goes, no, I was on site last Tuesday. And I said, no, you weren't because it was raining. I've got in my diary, site closed, rain today. And he's like, oh, oh, I don't know how that happened. And so... <laughs> Now, the reality is, if I, didn't be, if I wasn't recording when the site's closed, when the site's open, when it's raining, when it's sunshine, whatever it may be, all those little quirky details, because let me tell you, as a renovator, you've got a lot of stuff to do, you'll be busy, and I can't remember what I did three days ago, let alone two weeks ago. So um, you just these sort of little things will help you overcome some of those little obstacles. Um, there was even a day here where I came to site, and one of my tradies had, a, um, had his son on site, standing at the gate at 7 a.m. in the morning. And I said, hi, Daryl. And I said, who's this? And he goes, this is Jake, my son Jake. He's come to work with Dad to see what Dad does at work today. And I went, oh. I said, um, Daryl, you can't actually have children on a construction site. And I said, so um, you, you, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to, well, I appreciate, you know, you want to see, you know, see what Dad does. I said, I can't have him on, my, on your site because I'm liable for him if an accident happens. And he said, well, I haven't got a babysitter today. His wife was at work. And he said, I haven't got a babysitter. And I said, sorry, I just can't have him on site. And now, unfortunately, that day, I needed him to finish the plumbing because that day, a critical piece of work was happening and I didn't want to bump that other person. And uh, I said, you've got you to like, you, you organise somebody to find your son. And he, and he lived down the central coast. So it was like a two-hour commute either way. So I was stuck. And so I said to him, I said, look, you know, I, I explained to him, I said, look, this is just like not on. And he tried, he said, I'll try and make some phone calls. He made phone calls, nobody could mind his son. So I had to make a decision to let his son on the site. And so I got him to sign in my diary and, you know, also read it to it. It said, you know, discuss issues with Daryl regarding his son on site. Doesn't have a green, uh, white car, accident could occur. My insurance doesn't cover his details, blah, blah, blah. I, Daryl, blah, 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 take full responsibility. If my son, Jake, has an accident, I will not pursue a legal claim. I got him to sign it and date it. Now, the reality is, is that if Jake had, um, had an accident, guess who would have been still liable? me but at least now if they did go to court what the court will subpoena is your construction site diary okay so the your construction site diary can be used as evidence in court so it's better than nothing I still wouldn't have had any comeback but it's better than nothing at least if I had to go to court in that situation I can say look I extensively um, discussed this with him and you know I was in a situation blah 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 so I'll pass that around um, and you can see I keep all sorts of cards and all sorts of things Okay, portable filing system. What I do with my projects, especially if you're going to be doing, most of you are going to be doing these low-budget, quick cosmetic renos, you're going to have a lot of projects on the go. So hopefully, you know, you can all knock over, you know, at least one or two of these in your very first year as renovators. What I do to organise my system, the reality is I don't work in an office. I do work out on a construction site. So this is my mobile filing. This is my mobile filing cabinet. 
some really cheap little tools. As I said, um, a lot of the stuff I'm going to show you very simple, not expensive stuff to get yourself up and running. So I just go buy these little cases. You buy these from Officeworks. I think they're about $14 or $15. They come in all sorts of colours if you want to get really fancy. Uh, green lids, red lids, whatever it may be. Um, and um, what I do is I just label the front of the cover. So I just use this on a piece of paper. I laminate it with contact. And basically, I take this on site. Now, how I organise myself on site is that I just buy the cardboard sleeves from Officeworks. So needless to say, I shop at Bunnings and Officeworks a lot. Um, so what I do is I have, as you can see, just all these um, different cardboard sleeves for different trades. So I have a cardboard sleeve for my electrician, a cardboard sleeve for my plumber, one for my painters, one for my tilers. I have any, I have a f uh, one for and anything like quirky, like fireplace installer. Um, I have one there for my project expenses, so I keep all my expenses together. So when my tradies all submit my invoices, so when a tradie comes up to me, Tony the bricklayer says, "Sheree, here's my invoice um, on a Friday morning for payment that night." I don't just put on the desk and some wind blows it away into the never, you know, beyond wherever. It goes straight uh, straight away. It goes straight into my project management case, into that particular folder. I get home on a Friday afternoon and away I go. I sit at the computer for half an hour, pay all the invoices via EFT, and it's all done. So what I am, I'm really highly organised on site in a really simple way because the reality is um, you know Daryl the plumber will be down in the uh, down in the corner of the yard look you know with his head in some pit and he's there looking at the hydraulic drawings and basically so he'll be down there like that and he'll be looking at his drawings going that pit don't look like the, the pit on the drawings. So the first thing he's going to come up to me, so he'll have to do some changes, it's not right. So the first thing he's going to come up to me and go, Cherie, we've actually got a problem down in that pit down in the right-hand corner. The hydraulic drawings aren't right. So what I'll do is I'll go, so I'll go okay, hang on, Daryl. So I'll go straight to my folder, my hydraulic drawings. Flick, flick, flick. Okay, let's go. Let's go down and have a look at it. If I don't, if you're not organised like this, what happens? You go, oh, okay, Daryl. Well, actually, the plans are at home. I'll go and get them tomorrow. We'll solve that problem tomorrow. Delay, okay? <laughs> so just re like, is this really simple little stuff? Not hard. So if you can try and do that, also when you've finished your project, right, at the end of a project, and you have to go back and look at your project six months later or whatever, the cooktop breaks down. You know, your new buyer has bought the property and the microwave's blown up. Whatever it may be, you can just go straight to these folders, individual folders, and basically pull the documents out rather than sifting through three thousand pieces of paper. Um, so quite often for a big structural renovation, it's not uncommon for me to have three, four or five of these cases chock-a-block full of different trade folders, okay? Obviously, I think for most cosmetic renos, you'll probably go through two cases, okay? Okay, an artist case. I've got too many artist case. So when you go to Officeworks... When you're doing particularly structural renovation and even cosmetic renos, um, your, the reality is you're dealing on a construction site where there's a lot of dirt and dust and rain as well. When you don't have your, your architectural drawings protected, what happens is they buckle and also the print on the drawings fades as well. If it rains, they get soggy and hasta la vista, they're gone. For your architect to print out like even just one page of architectural drawings costs you like 10, 15 bucks. So, you know, they can get expensive. A lot of architectural plans, uh, you you know, they have like 10 sheets of paper. That could be like $100, $150 straight off the bat just to print one set of architectural plans. So make the investment. Go to Bunning, um, go to Officeworks. Officeworks sell these standard. They come in lots of different shapes and sizes. So this is, a, this is the smaller one here. Okay, so depending on your size, and they've got smaller ones again. So they've got A, you know, A4, A3, A2, right up to A1. So what I do is I basically, um, at the start of a project, so what I do is I set myself up at the start of a project and all I'm doing, actually this is my cookie cutter template that I was looking for the other day, so that's a different one, but I'll, I'll talk to you about that in a minute. Um, what I do, make sure I don't drop anything on my foot. So what I do, I just put my construction drawings in like that. Every morning I take those onto site with me. Um, the reality is this will get dirty. Like this case gets wiped over every single week. It gets putrid with dirt and dust and all sorts of things. So you just wipe it over because there's going to be times on site, particularly for you as a cosmetic renovator, you're not going to have a lot of detailed construction drawings. So whatever drawings you do want, you're quite going to be quite often measuring things. Um, so just make the investment about $40, $50. You only have to buy it once and you move it from project to project to project. Project. 
Now, when I, every morning, I typically start work at 7 o'clock in the morning before I started my speaking business, I was every morning on, um, at 7 o'clock. And um, what I do, this is what I do is I get out of the car. All the guys are waiting for me at 7 o'clock. You know, always be on time, guys. Don't keep your tradies waiting. If you're going to be delayed, sometimes you might want to give a, like a, a tradie that's working on your site a bit more longer, a second key, so that if you are caught in traffic, you're not obviously keeping all your tradies waiting. But pretty much what I do is I get out of my car every single morning. So I take these home every single night with me. I get out of the car, you know, open my back door. You know, I always put my little tool bot on right at, at right, basically right at the door, which is um, moving at the moment. Put that on, get out. And I always walked into the site, into the guys like this every single morning. Now, do I look semi-professional? And I've only got a silly plastic case in my hand. So what it is, most of all I'm doing is I'm just basically portraying an image that I'm treating this, I'm organised and I just look the part in terms of being, you know, an effective project manager. Okay. Scale ruler. You're going to need a scale ruler um, to measure drawings. So you just, again, little tools of the trade that you are going to require be required for um, as a professional renovator. Just measure little things. What you are going to need is a tool belt. Now, I, don't, I wear a tool belt every single day on site. I don't, look, I don't wear a tool belt to look sexy because your objective is to look as ugly as possible on your renovation site if you're a woman. Um, <laughs> I certainly don't look glamorous on my sites. Um, uh, so what I do is I... Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so what I do is I wear this little tool, but I mean, you would have seen from a lot of my weekly videos where I just, I literally wear this outfit, I'm not the same clothes, I've got many pairs of jeans, but um, <laughs> uh, that would be a bit stinky, but um, what, I would, what I do is I pretty much, this is the attire that I wear to work every single day, so I just wear different blue jeans every single day, I normally just as a renovator wear a couple of singlets, I always, for the females, I always wear a vest, okay, so um, otherwise your boobs will receive quotes, that's uh, reality. <laughs> Um, but most importantly, I wear this little tool belt. So I'm not wearing one of those big tool belts, you know, that have like 3,000 compartments and all its flashing lights and things like that. But the reason why I wear a tool belt is because I have a lot of project management tools, basically. This is my project management tool belt. Um, so what I do is, what I, I'll go through the things that I keep in my project management tool belt. First and foremost, my phone, okay? So I have an, an iPhone that always goes straight in my tool belt because as a renovator, particularly when you're doing this very fast renovations, you're going to have a lot of tradies on site. So for me, I have anywhere between 20 to 40 tradies on site every single day when I'm in the midst of a full-blown structural renovation. So I get all, a lot of them in, in and out very quickly, um, trying to make sure they don't work on top of each other. But what will happen is that you'll quite often get your tradie saying, Sheree, can you come here for a minute? Or Sheree, could you have a look at this? Or whatever, little issues that they want to discuss with me before they progress to the next stage. And so quite often what you'll be doing is, if you don't have a little tool belt, your hands can get very busy with things. So quite often, you know, I'm marking things out, um, Basically, I'll be going through things. So if you're like down on the floor, you know, talking to Mark the plumber and you're trying to work out the roughing thing, what you do is you put your, because you're going to be using your hands doing mark outs, particularly for low budget cosmetic renos, where you don't have any detailed construction drawings. So quite often you'll be marking things out, you know, on the wall, roughing in. I always keep my tape measure in my tool belt because what I'll be doing is I'll be saying, you know, Mark, that looks a bit high. What is that? Is that, you know, is that vanity roughed in, you know, 900? So quite often I'll be doing this. Now, if I don't have a little tool belt, what I'm doing is I'm holding that, I'm holding that, I'm trying to hold my mobile phone, and then suddenly you put it down on the ground, and then somebody else comes and grabs you, or you completely forget, if you're like me that forgets everything, you completely forget, and then you're wandering around, you start talking to somebody else on the side, meanwhile your mobile phone's ringing because all these suppliers are calling you back, you get back to your phone, well, half the time you lose your phone, you don't even know where it is, so you've got to go searching amongst the rubble, and then you find it, and then you've got like 10 messages to call back that you could have, you know, just quickly taken on your tool belt. So I mainly use my tool belt mainly for my mobile phone, my tape measure. So I always have my tape, like your, your tape measure is going to become your new best friend. And um, I also, I always carry my carpenter's pencils and I always carry a thick black texture in my tool belt as well, just for marking and writing different messages and so forth. So what it just means, it means I can keep my hands free and it just means I've got everything. So when, quite often when I'm walking around a big structure, I'll be walking around the site, my phone will ring, I quickly just go, 
Sheree speaking, I'm done and it's done, it's dealt with, rather than having to run, go, hang on, hang on, Tony, just go grab my mobile phone, okay? So it's just being a bit more professional and just more organised. <sighs> okay, project management desk. Um, I've got a little, uh, what I do on my renovation sites. There's no need for you guys to go to the expense of hiring a site office, highly expensive. I've never hired one in my life. I never will. Like they, like literally, you know, they're expensive. So keep things simple. Um, just go buy one of those forty-eight dollars table trestle tables from Bunnings. That's all I do. And what I do is, when I set up a renovation site, I basically take my laptop with me, um, and I also take a small printer, a cheap printer. Like, you know those 69 $1 ones that you can get from Officeworks? I don't care if it blows up or it fills up with dirt with any, every reno. I, wouldn't, I couldn't care less. So what I do is I take a laptop and I take a printer on site. I did actually have one around here. Um, I take a laptop and a printer on site so that during the day, I can do all the paperwork associated with the scope of works documents, if I've got to print out any specifications for the tradies, whatever it may be. So quite often on my renovation sites, regardless of whether I'm doing a quick cosmetic or a structural renovation, you will find me at my project. This is from my last site, see? Um, so you will find me on site, basically on the internet, surfing for my materials. So I'm working in advance of the tradies to make sure the materials are arriving. I'm on the phone organising the, the guys to you know, deliver the sand or the cement, whatever it may be. But more importantly, if you don't have a little printer and a laptop on site, and as I said, just go and buy a cheap one. Guys, can you find my laptop? I had a laptop, one of the cheap little laptops here. Um, if you're not on site, uh, if you don't have a laptop on site, like definitely don't put your Mac laptops on site because they'll last about a week. So what I do is I just buy some. I know some of you have got the laptops that we're giving you. They're like three hundred and six seventy dollar laptops, and they certainly do the job. So. Um, you know, it just, what it means is that you know, load, those, load, the, load your laptop up with the templates and then basically on site you can do all your scope of works documents. So when you know that you've got to start thinking about a painter, you can start organising your scope of works documents for the quote so you can start printing them out. I have a general rule, I don't work on the weekends on my renovation site because I try and have a balance between family life and work life as well. And so basically what I do is, with my rule that I don't work weekends, what it makes me do is become highly productive Monday to Friday. Now, thank you, Marianne. So this is just like a little laptop. You buy these from Bun uh, Bunnings <laughs> Office Works. I've got Bunnings on the brain. So if you just buy a little laptop like this, it's like $369 from Office Works. That's all you need on site, enough for you. You connect it to your $69 printer, like this printer here. I don't know if you can see it. There's a little printer there. I print it out on site. You know, those printers are so cheap that I just leave them there on site. I don't cart those home every single night. I don't care if a $69 printer gets stolen. It's not going to, you know, kill me. And so... Um, Print it out and that way when your traders are come on site, you can just pump the documents out. Because if you don't have this on site, what will happen is at the end of the day, you'll have a list of things that you have to do on the admin side and you'll go home and you'll spend the next two or three hours um, basically in bogged down in paperwork getting organised for the day before. So why not do that during the day? Can you, can you start to see the reasons why you should never be the DIYer? Because if you're actually in, in the trenches digging the holes and paving, painting the driveway and all that sort of stuff, then you're not doing the project management side, which is where you want to be. And if you don't manage this, this is how renovating can consume your life. I've had a couple of students who haven't actually followed what I've, I've basically said. And, and while I don't want you to all become mini-me's, that's, uh, me. like, that's not my intention for you to become mini-me's, but I'm just trying to help you in very simple ways to manage your time and be effective on site. So the students that have sort of disregarded that, um, I guess, that departing of knowledge, you know, they get to the end of their renovation, they say, I'm so exhausted, I can hardly breathe. And I say, well, it's because you, did, you didn't do this and this and this. So I do say these things for a reason. I hope you would take them into consideration. Okay, laptop and printer. So there's, there's the cheap little laptop there that I have, uh, printer that you get from Bunnings. So nothing fancy, it just means. So you can see... Office works. Did I say Bunnings, did I? Now I'm just going delusional. I don't know what I'm saying. So, um, yeah, and it's good when you have a project management desk set up on site because that's where the tradies know where Cherie is. Okay, so it's like your little office and they just naturally know to congregate. Go looking for you at that very first point there. Okay, site whiteboard. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> okay. Um, 
Okay, now there are going to be times where a lot of you are going to be working your full-time jobs and you, will not be one of, you won't be on site all the time. Is that correct? Yeah, and most of you. And there's sometimes there's no need for you to be all on site. Like, I just choose to be on site. If you don't want to be on site, you don't have to be on site. You're just going to have to work out how you're going to manage it, okay? One way that I manage things when I'm not on site, let's say, for example, if I have to, you know, speak somewhere and I'm not going to be on site, I have a site whiteboard. So it's exactly like this. Um, in fact, I'm going to get rid of all of this stuff. Oh, I stuck it on. That's the sign. I'll pass that around. That's the sign that typically gets hung. So um, this is the one, obviously, the colour for my council. But pass it around, have a look. And I have no idea what that one says. I probably should have read that before I gave it to you, but anyway. Um, so you have a site whiteboard like this. So you, just, um, you can basically make your own. And... You know, all the days of the week, Monday, Tuesday, blah, blah, blah. I won't, I won't basically outline them all. But what you basically, you leave messages for your tradies. So this is particularly good if you are working a job where you're in meetings or unavailable during the day because, you know, you're a consultant or whatever. You can leave messages. So here I'd say five tonnes sand being delivered today. You know, and whoever that, Tony for the bricklayer, whatever it may be, Rocco. Lime arriving, whatever it may be, CB. And then what will happen is when you come back, so if you can't be on site during the day, particularly for your cosmetic renos, what you should do at least is check in on the site at some point, either morning, afternoon or night after you finish work. What your tradies, so encourage your tradies as part of their briefing process, say, look, there's going to be some days where I'm not on site. So if you, leave them, if you have to leave me a message or you can't reach me on the phone, leave a message on the site whiteboard because every afternoon I'll pop into the site and I'll read that. So what you'll find is your tradies will actually start leaving messages Messages. So they'll write, uh, Cherie, half the time they'll spell your name wrong. Cherie, um, ran out of sand. Please order two tons more. Something like that, Tony. So then you come from your full time job, you come on site, you browse around the site, make sure work's happening, and you read your board, and you can see Sheree ran out of sand, please order two tons of sand. So then I would basically go back home, I would fax through an order for the sand supplier saying, you know, send a fax or an email, please deliver two tons of sand, here's the credit card de details. So it just it can, can, it can help the communication flow when you're not there. Mobile phone. You have to be really smart with your mobile phone. Um, as a renovator, if you don't manage your phone, you will have an exorbitant phone call. For a structural renovation, you might as well allocate ten, twenty thousand dollars on your mobile phone if you are on a normal call plan. So when uh, when I started doing renovations, my mobile phone bill was about one and a half thousand a month. It was ludicrous, and then I changed it to one of those one hundred and forty-nine talk your head off all day plans, um, which I can do, <laughs> which I do well. <laughs> so. So, uh, you know, when you're in the midst of a renovation, it's not unrealistic, like where you're getting a lot of tradies in and you're ringing a lot of supplies for materials and shopping around, it's not uncommon to get 100, 200 phone calls a day, okay? So you'll use your phone a lot and I would encourage you all to use headphones as well so that you don't um, die of radiation. So be organised with your mobile phone. You're probably thinking I've got some severe problems now, but what I also do is I, I categorise my tradespeople as well. So instead of, instead of when I've got a new tradesperson, instead of um, phoning them, as saving them in the contacts list as Tony, um, I, I categorise them as painter-Tony. Because what will happen is, on a renovation site, just by coincidence, every, every trade is called Joe, Tony, John. Uh, Rocco's, yeah, sort of not so common. But yeah, Joe, Joe, Tony, George. Yeah, Joe, Tony and George. Um, yeah, so what you want to do is, so if you don't, if you don't get, um, if you don't manage your phone, like if you're not even organised with your phone, you'll go, oh, who was that good bricklayer? Tony, Tony. And then you'll be scrolling through your phone and you'll have like 20 Tonys and you won't even know which one it is. So I do prefer to categorise them as the trade type dash Tony, and what I do is I ask my tradies on site, and iPhones are particular. Who's got an iPhone? 
fantastic, aren't they? You can't beat them. So what I do is I actually ask to take a photo of them. So I basically say, Tony, look, I just want to take a picture of you. Um, so I say, can you smile? And they all go... <laughs> they all get bashful. I say, look, it's not for me to Google you, at, um, like to oogle you at night when I'm, you know, at home. I say, I just deal with a lot of Tonys and Joes and stuff like that. So I just want to make sure that when I ring you for my next job, I've got the right Tony. And they go, oh, okay, should he? All right. So then, uh, so you take your photo and they go, okay. <laughs> and so, so I just find that because you quickly forget, you know, you quickly forget names, but you don't typically forget a face. Would you agree with that? So just even if you can try and be organized in that regard, you're going to be much better. So when I need a painter, I don't, don't scroll through the names. I now have a smorgasbord of like 20, 30 painters. So that if I can't get my favorite, I just go to the next painter on the list and go boom. Okay. So just being really organized. Ooh. Press the wrong button. Okay, business cards. You're going to be dealing with a lot of tradies. A lot of tradies are going to come in. Um, you're always going to aim for a minimum of three to five quotes for absolutely everything that you do. So you're going to get a lot of tradies coming out and expect to be dealing with a lot of tradies that don't speak the best English. That's a reality. So the last thing you want to be doing is when you want them to send a quote to you, the last thing you want to be saying, my email address is C-H-E-R-I-E at, like that's the last thing. And they go, what, what, S or C or or whatever, and it's frustrating. So make sure that in your tool belt, this is another reason for your tool belt, make sure you have a stash of business cards and that when, they, when a trade is about to leave site and you're, you want them to send them a quote to you and say, here's my card, look, here's all my details. If you can just fax or email the quote to here, that'd be great. It's already done and you've got less chance of actually getting the quote, like more chance getting the quote instead of it being bounced from the wrong address. Okay, tape measure. You're going to be using your tape measure a lot for all sorts of things, for basically measuring things, particularly for cosmetic renos, not so much for a structural renovation, but for cosmetic renos where you don't have detailed construction drawings, you're going to be basically measuring everything, okay? So many of you would have seen the property inspection where I trained Mary Ann how to do that property inspection checklist the other day, uh, other week. Did you get that video? Yep. Um, so even start talking like, uh, you know, measurements. So instead of saying, you know, it's nine, you know, um, 0 0.9 centimetres or whatever, it's 900 mil. Okay, so just try and refer to everything in mil. 1100 mil, 1800 mil, not 1 1.8 metres. Okay, so just try and be, just be conscious of your terminology. Okay, spirit level. You need a spirit level. In fact, I always had this in my tool belt. So I have a couple of big spirit levels. So I have a bigger one. I also have a smaller one. These aren't as obviously as accurate as a larger spirit level. But what I want to do is I always keep a spirit level in my tool belt because my job as a project manager is to manage time control, cost control, and quality control. Okay, I'll talk about this a bit later today. But basically, quality control is really important. Now, if you don't nip this in the bud and be on top of this, it will get you at the end. You don't notice defective building work in the construction, in the shell, in the basically up to the lockup stage, where you tend to notice the defects and winding is in the cosmetic, is in the fit out stage at the end. Um, have you ever seen when you've gone into a property um, and you might like, let's say the a bathroom floor and you've got a perfectly square floor like that and then it's coming in, they've done all the tiling, blah, blah, blah. You know, tiles are like that. And then the tile has ended like that and then they've had like a slight off cut in the corner or something like that. Have you ever noticed that? Yeah. That's defective building work. Somebody was well, something where along the line, something was not level or was out of plumb. So they basically had to infill that. So the reason for that is that somebody hasn't managed the quality control somewhere along the line. It's been slipped. So the more that you're on top of this, the better um, for you to be able to manage that. I'll give you an example. In my pinball project last year, I had some really expensive, I spent $40,000 just on the taps for that house alone. And so um, these particular taps were expensive uh, European tap and they had a stainless steel plate behind them. So that obviously the spout was sort of through here and then obviously the dial was through there and the spout came out like that. Now, there was six bathrooms in this house, so there's obviously um, same tap used right across the vanity, the shower, the toilet had similar sort of thing. So there was about 40 plates to put on and Daryl, my plumber, I said, make sure you, um, Daryl, can you make sure that you level, that all the, make sure all the plates are put on level? He said, yeah, of course, Sheree, like, of course. And so basically came in, um, he had installed one plate, and it's, it's, sorry, he'd installed two plates and I walked into the, like, to one of the rooms and I said, 
that doesn't look like it's level to me, Daryl. And like after you've been doing this for a number of years, you'll start to become like an eagle. You'll become finely, finely attuned to um, spotting stuff. Like you start seeing things that's not out of level. Who's, who works on a building site? I know there's a few builders. Can you, have you become skilled at noticing? Like you can just tell. Um, so I said to him, it doesn't look level to me. And he goes, I leveled it out, Cherie. Um, it's level. I said, it just doesn't. I said, I'm just, I'm just going to check it. So out I whipped my spirit level. And basically I went, like I measured those plates. And I went, Daryl, that's not actually level. So he was, it was almost level, but it wasn't. But it was about two mil out on one side. I said, they have, those plates have to be in. So I said, if I can notice that, the person, that, that owner of that house is going to notice that. That would have meant rework, pulling off 40 plates. You know, once you stick those adhesive tapes on the back, they would have all had to have been pulled off. That would have been trying to get the tape off and then having to put new tape on again. So that's your job as a project manager is to nip little things in the bud. Now, what you don't want to be is a project manager who's walking around measuring everything with your trade that's probably the quickest way to lose all of your tradies all right so what I say is that when a new tradie starts on site as part of my briefing process I just tell them a few rules as to how things work I like to work on my sites so this is part of the scope of works document where I basically say look um this and this and this in the scope of works document and I just say to them look my job as a project manager I, a lot of the times I make out to my pro um, I don't tell the tradies that it's at my own personal project I always tell them I'm renovating to sell or I'm renovating for profit I always say I'm renovating for profit so they know that so I always give them the um, the illusion that the house is going to be sold to a buyer regardless of whether I am or not and basically what I'm saying my excuse for them is saying look the buyer is always going to get a buy an inspection on this property and if it's not right it'll come back me on me and it'll also come back on you as a tradie so what I say to them look at my job as a project manager on site is to monitor the quality control from time to time you'll just see me walking around with this spirit level just measuring things to make sure that everything is level right through the whole construction process so I don't get tripped up on the end okay and if you tell your tradies this they will be more willing and understanding to work with you because it's only when you don't tell them this that they'll start thinking you're doing something dodgy behind their back or you're just being you know um, just picky in that regard okay so you need a carpenter's pencil <laughs> so I've killed off Chris now I'm onto the tradies right <laughs> So you want a carpenter's pencil, yeah, you want a carpenter's pencil and also just go from while you're at uh, office works, just buy yourself a thick texture because sometimes the pencil's not enough, like on concrete and sometimes you can't notice it. So the good old thick black texture does the trick. Um, there'll be a times on site where you can't be on site, particularly for you guys as cosmetic renovators, you're not going to be able to be on site. So quite often you'll need something drilled, like a, you want to position a light switch on the outside of a building where it needs to be roughed in, but you're not going to be there to, to basically say to the electrician, put it right here. So a lot of um, circumstances where you will um, do this sort of thing. I'm just going to make sure I use a texture that actually rubs off. Whiteboard marker, then I'll be in trouble. So quite often you'll do this sort of thing. Let's say we want to rough in, we want the plumber, uh, the electrician to mount an electrical light on the outside of your, you know, that your fresh walls have just been rendered. So you'll do this. You laugh. <laughs> All right. Then you'll come on site the next day and they've drilled there, 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 and there. And you'll go, ah. So um, there'll be lots of times where you have to just make it blatantly obvious, and not to that extent, obviously, but there'll be lots of times where you just need to make, you know, that's where your, your text is. And your, so they're just little tools of the trade that you need to get you up and running. All right. A square. A square is a quality control tool as well. Sometimes it also doubles as a weapon, all right? <laughs> so when your traders are getting out of line, you come after them, <laughs> all right? So um, what this is, it just basically measures it whether your walls and floors are out of plumb as well. So it's very simple to use. Um, you just basically put it up against the floor and it can tell you. Um, so quite often it'll run up the wall and it'll actually tell you how, how far a wall is out. So if you're dealing with things like new brick walls being built with your brick layers and all that sort of stuff, then you can just make sure that things are kept plumb. I'm onto it, Lise. Yep. <laughs> all 
All right. A work ute. If you are going to be a professional renovator, um, it probably is, you know, and particularly a cosmetic renovator more so, you, it's probably wise to make an investment in some sort of ute. Now, you don't need to go get one of those HSV $70,000 utes. Um, this is my truck here, my little truck here. Um, I always get embarrassed when I drive that. I feel like a trucker chick. I like put on my dark sunglasses and hope none of my students see me. Um, and so, um, you know... It's definitely like a man, ma a man magnet, though, driving your truck um, for all the single ladies in the audience. Um, so, yeah, look, just keep your, keep your work, you, because there's going to be lots of times we have to go um, buy bricks and things. Like on the, on the cosmetic renovation that I just finished in January, my work truck was um, full of just um, all the strip-out items that I'd done on a previous renovation, so it was full. So I had to go and take my own personal car and, you know, I've, I've got a, a reasonably new, um, you know, BMW. And so I had my brand new BMW that was full of bricks, like a, 310 bricks in the back. Um, and there was concrete dust all over the back. So that's the sort of stuff you don't probably want to do. So um, buy yourself. Now, my truck was only uh, $4,000. In fact, if anybody's interested in buying the, my truck, I'm actually selling it. So um, not because it doesn't work, I just I don't need it at this point in time. So yeah, just invest yourself in a little truck because um, there'll be times where you have to go and buy, you know, you get your um, fixtures and fittings, like you might have to go pick up your cooktop and your oven, which are in big box if you don't want to get it delivered. You can either pay the suppliers $100 to go and deliver it for you, or you can go and buy a cheap ute for $2,000. You made the one-off investment and you can use it in your projects moving forward. So if you are going to be a serious renovator, seriously think about going and buying a cheap ute. You don't have to buy an expensive. You go to the Pickles auctions all those cheap auction yards and you pick them up for next to nothing. Uh, eight months or so. Yeah. Okay, um, dress, dress um, appropriately. In terms of your dress, you want to make sure that um, you're using appropriate clothes on site. Safety boots are an absolute ma uh, mandatory thing on construction sites these days, so you need to get steel cap safety boots. Um, I particularly like the red back boots, um, but these sorts of things you pick up for about $80, $90, $120, 130 at the absolute most, and typically your work boots will last you for approximately 10 years or so, okay, in my experience. Okay, um, just as I said, for ladies, I do wear a vest. Uh, I know you think I'm trying to be funny, but I'm not. But um, the reality is um, y you just, you just want to, um, like I said, you don't want your boobs to receive quotes. So um, just, you know, the objective is... I don't even want to look at what that was. Um, somebody actually said, is this you? And I said, I wish. Um, so... Yeah, you just want to um, dress down. Uh, you know, when I'm on site, I wear literally no... I mean, you've seen me in my renovation videos. I look like a haggard old witch, right? Um, but, you know, I don't wear... I, don't, I wear very minimal makeup. Um, I always have my hair pulled like, back like this. I want them to take me seriously on a site. And I think particularly for all the ladies in the audience, um, it's not a fashion parade. Don't get there with your bandanas and your, your ripped jeans and your you know, sexy, sexy singlets. Leave that to the renovation TV show people. So, you know, install site sites. So we're going to go through some of these things. So use this little checklist here. Tick, 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 tick. I've done that. Once you do everything on that list, your site will be ready to start work. Okay. First of all, what you need to do is before you start work on any site, regardless of whether it's a cosmetic or a structural reno, you re should ring Dial Before You Dig. Have you heard of that company before? Okay, so what they do is they locate, they have a listing of where all the underground pipes and services and fibre optic cables, the Telstra lines, all those sorts of things, where they are positioned on your site and around your site. So if you dial 1100, it's a free service. And what I would encourage you all to do is do a practice run right now. I'm oh, sorry, tomorrow when you get home. And basically uh, ring them up and just order the dial before you dig plans on your own property that you're living in now, regardless of whether it's a rental property or your own own, own house that you own, just see what they send you. So what they'll do is I'll send you a lot of plans. Um, in fact, I've actually got some of my one of my projects here. I might even just hand the folder around so you can actually see what they are. So if I can get one of the crew members to help with that, that would be great. Um, so what they'll do is they'll actually send you all the plans. I'll send you some really big um, A2 sort of plans with all the fibre optic cables and they'll send you a lot of survey type style documents. Um, we're all the underground pipes. So when you're putting in your new driveway, so in that concrete driveway that's all uneven and needs to be ri ripped up and then you need to come straight in, at least you'll know when your excavator comes in, you can show them the dial before you dig plans so they know exactly where they've got to be careful in terms of digging pipes and things. So if you could just find, find uh, my dial before you dig um, folder it somewhere in one of those cases. Thank you. All right.
So it's a free service. Um, I mean, this is a, a bit of an extreme sample, uh, example, but you can obviously see an excavator here has gone right through a gas pipe out in the regional areas. You know, obviously done major damage. Um, so don't think, uh, don't think accidents don't happen, okay? Your job as a project manager is to make sure you have safe sites 100% of the time. So I'm absolute vigilant with this. Um, this is where I spend a large portion of my days making sure the sites are clean, making sure the tradies are aware if they see any site hazards, make sure they come and report them to me. So in this instance, they never found the excavator or the excavator, okay? Completely demolished, gone. So accidents do happen. Um, I subscribe to the, like the, uh, what do you call it? The e the alerts from um, work cover alerts. That's what I was looking for. And you know, you, you from time to time you see you know another fatality. So don't think accidents don't happen on construction sites. They do. Okay, temporary fencing. Temporary fencing is an absolute must. Doesn't matter if it's a structural renovation or a cosmetic renovation. You always want to aim for temporary fencing at the front of your property. Even for low budget cosmetic renos, the reno that I did in in January, I still had temporary fencing installed around that site. The reason being is that renovation sites attract thieves. Um, that's the reality. I don't think I've ever had a renovation site where nothing has not been stolen. Even on my current project in Leichhardt, the designer acrylic bath got stolen. So people come and choose, um, come and steal things all the time. Tools, just all sorts of things. So you need to lock those sorts of things up. Now, what temporary fencing does, it actually just, it's a deterrent. It actually is just another thing. They have to get through your gates in order to get onto your site. When you've got no gates whatsoever, it's just making it very easy on them. And so what you want to do with temporary fencing, there's a couple of things. Um, let's say you've got a normal, a normal site. Imagine we're like a bird looking down and these are all the houses on the street through that. You've got your houses at the front here like that. Let's say this is your site here. What you want to do with temporary fencing on a normal site, I always put temporary fencing right across the front there. So make sure it's not on the council property that's always on your boundary because if a council ranger comes along, quite often as renovators, you know how you've got the curb here and the street is here. Quite often you'll be, you'll be tempted to put the temporary fencing out here, but you can't. So if, that, if, that, if you do that, the council rangers will come and make you move it right onto your boundary. And it's also a liability issue when, you know, Nanny's walking up the street with her little dog um, or the Blue Rinse Brigade, and basically, um, you know, they come along, they can actually, and they, they trip and fall or do whatever, you are liable. So make sure your temporary fencing goes right across there. What I also do is, to make it hard for thieves, I always make sure I'm one, at least one or two panels into the property just there. So you don't need to take it all the way down to the side of the property, um, but, you know, because quite often a lot of um, planting on neighbours is actually on the sides of the property, so sometimes you can get away with it. But if there's absolutely no planning whatsoever, you really need to enclose the whole front yard of your fence, okay? So you want to make it as secure as possible, make it hard for fees to pick up your new cooktop and actually walk off the site with it. Okay, in terms of your gates, let's say, let's assume this is a normal house and your driveway is down the left side of this um, property here. So obviously your gates are going to go through here. When you're ordering your panels, you don't need to um, tell them that you order gates. The gates, the only difference between the fence panels is that the, the all the fence pans, panels are clipped with a little clamp and the gates don't have any clamps, so they swing open. You always want to make sure, so make sure you have a set of gates there for the driveway because the reality is trucks are going to pull in and out of the driveway, dropping off sand, soil, cement, plants, pavers, tiles, whatever it may be. Sometimes it's actually worth even making sure you have another set of gates at another point in the property because sometimes as a renovator you can get so many materials coming at once like the timber yard will drop off you know 10 lengths of 4 by 2 or whatever it may be and then the, the pebbles will arrive shortly thereafter particularly if you're doing very fast renovations. Um, so this area can, can become quite congested and you want to basically have another point. Quite often with the renovations your front yards will become storage areas for your renovation sites particularly if you're dealing in inner city locations where space is tight, you're going to be shuffling stuff around all the time, so you want to try and minimise that wherever you can. Okay, um, site safety signage is an absolute must these days. Um, I would encourage all of you to go to the Master Builders Association or either the Housing Industry Association. These signs are all standard off the self shine signs, so you don't need to go and get any of these custom made. Most of these signs are about $100, $120, so you buy them once and guess what? You've got them for life, okay? So make sure you really protect these signs. Um, 
What you can do is, um, some of them have the piercings in the corner, some of them don't. Just to let you know, the easiest way to actually punch a hole on these things is just to get a, um, a screwdriver straight in, makes a nice clean hole. So don't attempt to do this with a Stanley knife or anything like that. You just punch it the inside with the screwdriver, away you go. And then you always cable tie these sorts of these signs to your temporary fencing. Some of the fencing contractors will come out and they'll actually install it for you, like temporary fence hire. They say, do you want me to staple your signs to your fence? And they come out with this metal clamp and it clamps them. But that metal clamp comes off like a week later and it's very easy to rip that clamp off. When you go buy those, you know, those plastic cable ties, they don't come off. Now, on your, on your construction sites, you're going to have kids, depending on what area you live in. You're just going to have kids loitering the street, you know, just mucking around and being silly, or drunk people just mucking around. And if you've got this sign, because these signs always go on the outside of your fence, typically. Um, you can put them on inside, sometimes on the inside, but most cases um, on the outside. So, you know, somebody's toitering down the street, drunk on a Saturday night, and, oh, and then, you know, and they just rip your sign off. So it's half the time, if you don't adhere these signs properly to your temporary fence, you're going to come to work on Monday morning and guess what? Your sign's gone. 120 bucks down the drain that you have to basically go and buy another one. So make sure you always plastic cable tie them and make sure the cable ties are really tight so it makes, makes it really hard for people to get them off. So there's, these are the standard signs. So that's a great one to have. That's a very general one. Um, you can buy smaller ones like this. You know, all visitors must report to site office. Um, and the reality is you don't have a site office, but you have a little project management desk, so that's perfectly fine. There's other signs that you need, such as uh, this one. So please keep out. Your job as a professional renovator is to make sure nobody comes on your site that really doesn't need to be on your site. So Beryl, Madge, and um, uh, what, what's another name? Old name. Oh, Fanny, that's a terrible name. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, the blue, and unfortunately, old ladies are the worst. Quite often, when you start your renovation, I was saying this to somebody yesterday, when you start renovating your house, guess what happens to all the other neighbours? It becomes like an infectious disease and they start renovating their house as well. So everybody's curious as to what you're doing inside your house, especially when they hear the sagittal saws going... They want to know what you're doing. People are just naturally curious. So you'll get particularly a lot of older people who've just got a lot of time on their hands and they'll say, oh, gee, love, the house is coming along really good. What's it like inside? And they do that all the time. And so what you have to do is you have to like keep them as much as you would love to show them through. You have to say, look, I'm sorry, I can't let you on site because as soon as you step on site, you are liable. So if Beryl comes through and she's toitering through a construction zone where the driveway has been, you know, ripped up and, um, you know, it's not necessarily straight she can come if she falls you're liable for that so try and get into the habit of minimizing the number of people so on my construction sites I always have the gates closed 100% of the time on site a lot of people a lot of builders a lot of other developers renovators I guess leave their sites they come in they open the gates straight away so it just it's an open invitation for people to come on so just keep your sites closed wherever possible these signs you buy them from office works now believe it or not Bunning also sell them all those signs over there across the prize table they all came from Bunnings and so um, you know they, you buy these these ones in office works are about twelve fourteen dollars the big ones are about twenty thirty dollars through Bunnings so make sure you have the appropriate signs and there's certainly information in your manuals about the key signs that you need to get one sign that I particularly like from the Master Builders Association is your project management sign. When you come out to my site tomorrow, you'll see this on my current site. And it's actually got all the details of the builder, the project manager, the certifier. So you always have to have a contact phone number on your temporary fencing as to who is managing the site. Because if there's some issue at night, um, an explosion or you know, kids are got into your house and they're mucking around, the neighbours have to have a phone number to call in case there's some sort of emergency or the ranger needs to get in contact with you. So that's a particularly good sign from the Master Builders Association. Okay, toilets. I know you're thinking, oh, I've got to talk about toilets. But yeah, we've got to talk about toilets. Um, port -a -loo, um, on a construction site, even a low-budget cosmetic reno, for two weeks, get a port -a -loo in. As a professional renovator, you want your tradies to do as much work as possible um, all the time. So be highly productive during the day. If they have to go to the toilet, they're basically off-site and you've got no toilet on-site, they're going to be going off-site. They'll run to the local pub, the local shops, whatever it may be. You've got to remember, um, tradies do a lot of physical work, so they therefore drink 
a lot of water. They go to the toilet a lot. So you want, don't want your tradies hopping off site two or three times a day during that eight hours to run off to the toilet because I guarantee you by the time they get in their car, stop work, get in their car, drive up the street, go to the toilet, they'll grab a coffee, come back, you've just lost half an hour. And if they do that two or three times a day, that's like an hour or an hour or two um, lost productivity on site. So nip that in the bud, hire your toilets. There's a couple of different types of toilets. You've got um, chemical flush, and I certainly don't go into detail about this one video. I'll, I'll do it just all on the dunny. Um, but um, what, what you've got is basically your chemical flush toilets, which is where... Um, do your business and uh, there's you know chemicals that clean it and um, it goes into like a pit and then a truck comes along once every week or every fortnight and they pump everything out of the toilet so that's the times when you don't want to be on site and uh, the other type is a sewer connect this is where your plumber will come in they'll locate, locate the sewer lines on site they'll smash a little hole and they'll just hook your toilet into the back um, so quite often you will be determined where you can put your toilet will be based on where the sewer lines will be. So if this is your site here, and the, you know the sewer lines are sort of uh, I don't know, running like that through you know through the guts of it. Oh, they wouldn't never do that. But um, if they're running through the guts, then your plumber can come in, just knock a hole there, and they position your portal loo down there. They hook it in. So that's just a normal flush, like you flush your toilet like you do normally. Um, and there, I always believe they're the best types of toilet because they just don't stink. Toilets can be really expensive. port loos can be really expensive to hire. Um, just for a fairly standard port loo um, with a chemical flush system, you're looking at anywhere between $45 to $80 a week, depending on what company you go to and what state you're in. So if you're doing a cosmetic renovation over the course of six weeks, um, it can start to rack up. There's a, you know, pretty much $1,000 there off the bat. Or you can buy your own. So I own my own port loo which you'll see on my site uh, tomorrow. Um, it costs, you can buy your own port loo outright sewer connect toilet for $1,000. Or if you're doing a, you know, if you do a structural renovation, you might as well buy your own port loo outright because it'll actually be cheaper to buy your own port loo than actually to hire one if you're doing a six-month uh, structural renovation. So you make the one-off investment, you've got it, and you've got it for life. The issue is what do you do with it when you don't have a product? So that's when it becomes a really nice garden ornament. Okay, sediment control. When you install your temporary fencing, you have to have a thing called sediment control. And what sediment control is basically, um, have you ever seen sandbags and things out the front of sites? Um, it, sediment control comes in many different shapes and forms. You've got sandbags, you've got hail bales, all sorts of things. So what it does, it's basically just a line. So very, it can be very similar. And you'll certainly see sediment control out on my site tomorrow. So I'll point that out for you. Um, so it's basically when, when uh, it stops environmental pollution on a site. So particularly when it rains, what happens, and if you've got a sloping site, um, it rains, all the dirty water runs off the site and it runs into the drain. Have you ever seen when it's raining dirty water coming from a construction site, like, you know, that chocolatey brown water running down the street? That is technically called environmental pollution and rangers are absolutely rife with this. If a ranger sees dirty water running off your site, and it only has to be a trickle, if they see dirty water running off your site, as an individual, you'll be fined $750 and company uh, 1,500 straight off the bat. So it's worth getting sediment control because they are extremely tough on that. It's also just not when it rains. Environmental pollution can be when a truck pulls into your site like this. So if I maybe get one of the crew pillar, if you can be my, my beautiful whiteboard girl. Um, when a truck pulls in to your site, let's say this is your driveway, quite often as a renovator, you know, things are going to be ripped apart, as I said. So you'll pull into the driveway and the truck will dump off, you know, five tons of sand or pebbles or mulch, whatever it may be. And if, particularly if it's raining, what happens is the truck will pull out. Have you ever seen tyre marks on the street? That is environmental pollution. So rangers are absolutely rife with that. And they can always tell which side it came from because they've got the truck marks. They trace it back. So needless to say, that pinball job that I did last year, that I, one of the, I guess one of the quirky things I got tripped up was that suburb has the highest rainfall than any other suburb in Australia. So every day on site it rained. So um, I was forever trying to basically like getting the labourers to wipe the street down of, of truck marks. Now how I got over that, I actually had a ranger come out on site and said, look, there's actually some faint truck 
prints on the street. And I said, well, how am I supposed to get around this? Like the, the site's you know, under construction. I said, well, what can I do? And he said, well, you're not allowed to have any stuff. And I said, well, what, why don't I actually... Um, so I came up with a solution. I said, what about if I do this? What about if I get some blue metal and I will put it over the driveway and I'll also put it over the council strip? And he said to me, mm, you know, it's a bit of a liability. Somebody comes and walks and trips on that blue metal. I said, look, I put a really thin layer and he's actually happy with that. So there, are, there sometimes can be solutions to problems like that. Oh, it's on, sorry. <laughs> Cherie, I just noticed, I just happened to be looking at your diary just as you said that, and the council inspector called at 8.30 and fined you for not having sediment control in place on your site. Thank you. And it was Friday the 13th. Ah, oh, are you serious? There you go. So, they are, yeah, they're absolutely vigilant with it. So, yeah, I've been... I've, the problem is, you know what, people steal your sediment control. It goes like, at the moment, I just went out on my site uh, Friday and um, the sediment control, I only had two bags of sediment control there. So people just steal your sediment control. Just makes you wonder. So it's one of the things that always, and unfortunately you can't control that because it's right out on the street. Like it's on the boundary of your property, stopping it from running out onto the street. So unfortunately you just got to, it's one of those things. It's crazy. Like why would somebody want a sandbag? But anyway. Um, First aid kit. Uh, your responsibility as a project manager is to make sure that you have a first aid kit always on hand. Oh, where is my first aid kit? Um, so you can buy from Bunnings these um, different categories of first aid kit. Uh, there are kits like a class one or category one is like one to five people. Um, if you've got a site where there's more than five workers, like the five to 25 workers is like a category two and a category three might be 25 plus workers. So with your first aid kit, uh, make sure that you do stock it up. So what I tend to do is I tend to replenish the first aid kit at the start of every single renovation. Um, this is my first aid kit coming down the hallway. So just to give you an idea, so this is a little one that I have because I typically, as I said, have, you know, somewhere between 20 to 40 tradies on site every single day. So you'll, make, you'll spend a couple of hundred dollars. Bunnings sell these for about $150. So in every single kit, um, you know, oh, see, that's tight. Okay. So every kit, the, the, the problem with these first aid kits is so they come with all those, you know, sort of standard sort of stuff. The problem is quite often tradies are going to come to you and they've just got like a splinter in their finger so you can never find a normal Band-Aid. You can find one that's about 400 metres long but not a normal one. So what I tend to do is just um, add my own little replenishments to it. So I just put tweezers in there. Um, quite often I put just normal um, Band-Aids and I always put baby wipes because tradies have very dirty fingers a lot of the time. So just stock it up. Make sure this kit is full and it's replenished and you basically start the, each project fresh with a completely new kit. Now what I do on my sites is I actually, um, I actually chain the first aid kit so I don't have to um, cart things in and out of the site every single day. What I do is I will allocate a site, um, a, an area on site. So if I've got my temporary fence, sorry Pella, if, if that's my block of land and I've got my temporary fencing go through here, and that's, you know, that's the driveway and that's the gate. Quite often I will actually get just like a piece of chain very similar to the chain that you've seen over the desk there. I will get a chain. I actually just put it, loop it through that. I put it through the, tie it through the temporary fence. I padlock it. I install my first aid sign, which is the big first aid sign that you see over there. And I just leave that on site permanently for the whole duration of the renovation. My tradies coming in and out know where the first aid kit is if they need it, okay? So very easy in that regard. So just on the padlock and chain, sorry, Pillar, could you um, just grab me or one of the crew members, please, just grab me the padlock and chain. So I'll come back to that. All right, site facilities. Think outside the square when determining your site facilities. So what I do is when I set up a renovation site, even if it's just a low-budget cosmetic reno, I'll have two of those cheap trestle tables and some of those plastic chairs that you buy for, like, you know, where you, those outdoor dinner settings that you buy $100 and you get a, chair, a table and 10 chairs. I will basically do that and I dedicate a little meals area on site because what I want to try and do is, is I want to try and encourage tradies to take their meals all at the same time. It's actually a good way to foster um, the tradies working together and just you know having a good time on site as well. So basically, um, just diverting around for a second, when it comes to your temporary fencing, even be smart about how you put your chain. So don't go buy some flimsy little chain. Make sure it's a thicker chain that's going to be harder to get off. These chains are about 5 or $6 and you can buy them by the meter at Bunnings. 
So most people's instant reaction is basically just to loop the chain around through the fence and just put a padlock, padlock like that, but make it hard on your thieves. So what I do is I buy a slightly longer chain and I wrap it around a couple of sections and then I padlock it at the bottom. Because those temporary fences are steel, what it does when one chain, like a thief, they're going to come into back, because they come in with bolt cutters and they can get in very easy. So, you know, um, criminals know these, these shortcuts. So when it's only wrapped around one spot, they can actually hold it so it doesn't make a clinking noise that the neighbours will hear. But if you've got it wrapped around a couple of sections, these chains, because they're heavy, they move pretty quickly. So just wrap it around. That's just a little personal tip that I've learned over the years. Okay. Um, so set up a, try and set up a little designated mill area on site. It's just a trestle table, some plastic chairs. What I do for my work is I supply, I just have one of those, you know, those never fail dispensers. So they've got fresh water on site. Um, I also just buy, you know, things like some cookies or biscuits or packs of Arnott's biscuits, whatever it may be. And I try and encourage my tradies to take their meals together at a set time. So we just laugh around, we have a joke and that's how you can start to have fun on your sites. And if your tradies enjoy working on your site, you know, in that environment, then they're more likely to want to work with you and future projects as well. Um, you know, you can get really creative with your site facilities. One of my students um, actually bought a car an old beat up caravan and that was his site, um, his, site, his site shed and his site facilities. So I actually went out to his site and he was so excited. He said, Cherie, you've got to come, got to come and have a look at my site office. And I went and had a look at this beat up old caravan. I went, oh, that's really cool. Because I used to like go on, away in the caravan as a kid when I was in the younger and I hadn't been in a caravan for years. I'm like, this is really cool. And he goes, it's even got a bed. So when the tradies get a bit tired, they can never have a sleep during their day and I went uh, that's not what you want to be doing Jazz okay so you can get creative brooms you need two big brooms on site you need a big industrial broom so you need like a bigger broom to get all the big stuff because quite often you're going to have people like tilers plasterers laminate floorboard installers they leave stuff around so your job as a project manager is not to be the DIYer my job as a project manager is to make sure the sites are as clean as possible as much as possible because the reality is if even if like somebody's um, installing some tiles or they're installing some floorboards tradies typically only clean up at the end and so I've always sort of like one of those people that are just sort of scooting around quickly like just have the brooms around I just quickly sweep up into a corner and then you know clean it up at the end of the day so you know this could be that one tradie who's walking through the house you know the electrician with the box of down lights who doesn't see um, that piece of you know that piece of laminate flooring right there and suddenly goes like that and they smash their head on the tiles and that's how the most simple of accidents happen so your job is to maintain a, a, safe, a safe clean site wherever possible so you need two brooms you need a big industrial broom to get the big things like the big pieces of tiles and plasterboard off and then I always keep a smaller just a normal household broom to get the fine dust fine dust is very slippery in a lot of floor environments in a construction site and it's that it's more so that fine dust that will make people slip rather than the big stuff okay you can apply for what's called a work zone permit. A work zone permit is a sign. Have you ever gone to a construction sign where you've seen a sign at either end of the site that says no parking this way? Ever seen that? That's called a work zone permit. And basically what that means is that you have the space at the front of your site dedicated to you for the purposes of construction works. So what will happen is the, um, this is your site. So the council will come along. You pay a fee for this, so it can be a little bit pricey. So only make sure your work zone signs, your permit goes in when truly when you start construction and you need it. And what they do is the council will come up. This is the footpath, you know, the curb, the footpath. They'll come and put a sign there. And they'll come and put a sign here. It says no parking that way, no parking that way. So what it means is you've got dedicated, um, this dedicated space out the front of your property to basically delivering trucks and delivery trucks in and out. Now in outer metropolitan suburbs, this is really not such an issue. In country areas that's not an issue it's going to be an issue in what locations in the city areas okay where parking is an absolute premium okay I mean this is a classic example now if you don't have if you're going to be doing renos in the inner city locations really worth um, getting a work zone permit for the reason being that if you don't get that nine out of ten chances that neighbors are going to be parked out the front of your property when you come in when you're con you know getting concrete pump truck in that morning or whatever it may be what happens those trucks will come and they'll block the street now most people go and they concrete things like concrete trucks and um, deliveries always turn up at seven eight o'clock in the morning that time when everybody is on their way to work that's just Murphy's law 
And so what happens is those owners get stuck behind a truck and most people are fairly patient for about a minute or two and then they start to turn into raging bulls anything over two minutes. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Particularly if they're trying to get to work. So they'll be patient, they'll be patient, then suddenly their patience, they'll just lose it and they'll be honking their horn saying, hurry up, what's going on? And, you know, that somebody will run out from the site and say, look, you know, we're going to be 10 minutes. First thing they do, they'll get cheesed off and who are they going to call? The council. Who does the council notify? The ranger, the ranger's out, you're blocking the street, you get fined. So um, they're, vi they're really vigilant with that. Okay, make sure you have a supply of personal safety attire. For me as a safe project manager, what I do is I always make sure I have a, a basic inventory of earplugs, safety glasses, um, things like, resp like this, like respirators. Um, I even have sunscreen, so I buy the bulk, you know, the bulk packs, uh, the bulk tubs of sunscreen. Uh, buy those and also sun hats as well. So the reality is a lot of tradies will bring this themselves, but sometimes tradies don't. So if, um, if there's going to be a tradie working on site, for example, um, a concrete cutter was coming in and had to concrete something for say half an hour I will go around to all the tradies and I'll say Tony do you want some um, they're going to start concrete cutting in half an hour do you want some earplugs because it could be noisy and I basically offer it to them whether they want to take it or not is up to them but at least I've done the right thing as a project manager and offered it to them so what you'll find is just you know have a basic inventory do this once at the start of a project and that way you'll use it through the project if you don't use it you just use it for the next one okay which is hats um, Witches hats are great. You'd probably need to go out and buy some, probably, you know, five or six to set up your renovation site at the moment. Um, or you can get them free when you're drunk on a Saturday night, um, <laughs> which I'm guilty of. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Order the witches hat. I'll go get it. <laughs> anyway, and so, um, yeah, what, where you use witches hats is basically you're going to have trucks pulling in and out of your property, like delivery trucks all the time, particularly if you're doing a big structural renovation. Expect, you know, two, three, four trucks to pull up each day. Quite often some of these bigger trucks can be... Um, slightly dangerous so they'll sort of eat into the drive the the actual roadway so all you do is you basically if you've got a truck here you're just going to really common sense you've got your truck there you know just put one here one here one there one there one there and what it's just doing it's visually alerting motorists to go around that truck again if you've got some person who's driving you know some 20 year old who's driving down the street text messaging while they're driving and then suddenly not looking go ah like and they, they ram into the back of a truck at least if they go obviously they'd be injured they go to court you can say well I took all the necessary precautions I had safety barricades safety witches hats out on the road I took I did everything that I should as a construction project manager okay lollipop sticks uh, now you don't need the like you know the grape or the banana variety what you do need is um, what you do need is these lollipop sticks here God you could have made it early sorry me girls okay um, so Lollipop sticks. I love playing the lollipop girl on my sites. So basically you need these lollipop sticks, um, stop and so just to manage traffic. Now the reality is you need a license to operate a lollipop stick. <laughs> All right, believe it or not. Uh, so, um, so you do need a license if you're working on commercial, you know, um, obviously commercial sites and commercial roads and just normal residential roads. And, and in all truthfulness, I should have a license to operate a lollipop stick. But what I, um, I don't. Um, for me, um, and I probably will never get a, I won't, I'm just not going to get a license for one. It's, so what I will do, what I do though is um, I always take precautions because when those delivery trucks are coming in, again, not so, not so much of an issue with a cosmetic reno. I mean, you will get delivery trucks coming in. I certainly use these on my latest cosmetic reno. But um, particularly on a structural renovation, you're going to get a lot of truck deliveries coming into your site. Just timber, tiles, you know, all sorts of things, plasterboard. And so the last thing you want, so can I get you to hold that pillar? The last thing you want, this is what I did for my first few years when trucks were coming in out of my site because I didn't, I didn't sort of realise some of these things until years later. What I was doing is I was running out in the road and going <laughs> like that. And motors would be driving down the road and I go, who's this crazy chick running up the street going like that? That is the quickest way to basically get into an argument with a motorist because they think, who is she? Who's she got the right to tell me to stop in the middle of the road? So they get really, so needless to say, like even though I was trying to do the right thing, I probably got more frowns rather than positive comments. So it wasn't until I got my lollipop sticks that um, basically people took, took me a little bit more serious and more receptive. So I always make sure on my sites, sorry, let's pull off and get you to hold that again. On my sites, what I do is I keep these safety vests. So at, the, my, at my temporary fencing, 
where my, t- my gates are, I normally just keep two or three of these safety vests. I actually just loop them through the fence like that, so they're just there. So as soon as a truck pulls up, myself or the laborers will quickly go like that, pull it out of the fence. You just quickly whip it on, and then you run straight out into the road like that, and it's done, okay? Straight out. So you always make sure you have two lollipop people, one either side of the road. Now, if you're on a really small renovation site, even one's just fine. You've just got to be able to manage that. For me, yes, you do need a license, and I do, you know, I'm not encouraging any of you to go. I mean, you can if you want, but I'd probably say most of you won't. But for me, it's better to be a safe project manager than not be a safe project manager, okay? So again, if anything ever went to court, you can say, well, you know, I wasn't licensed, but I did try to do the right thing here. And council rangers are pretty good like that. If they can generally see that you are trying to do the right thing, then they're going to be a lot easier on you. When you So you can buy those for about $120 each. They're not expensive. You will need two for your sites. You can buy them from the internet, but just make sure you put in traffic control management signs. Otherwise, you will have every variety of um, lollipops coming up, strawberry grape, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Make sure you have a quantity of disposable items on site. Uh, you need lots of toilet paper as a renovator. All right. I don't know what tradies do with it, but it, they steal it or whatever. I don't know. Mark, what do what you guys... Where's my tradie? Um, they, yeah, toilet paper always goes missing on renovation sites. You don't want to be running to Woolies every couple of days and buying six-pack of toilet paper because toilet paper is expensive, right? So what you want to do, get smart, buy your materials in bulk. So um, quite often what I'll do is I'll go and just order it in bulk, in the bulk packs. You can buy it on eBay. You can go to Flemington Markets and buy like 48 rolls for 20 bucks because all that sort of stuff, it just it all adds up. Okay, I have garbage bags, I have um, hand soap for the port loo so there's just a couple of housekeeping things that you should always have on site. Okay, basic tools. This is my little toolbox, I take it to site. Actually, I just upgraded it recently because my other one was a bit battered. Um, so what I do is I always take, I just always have my own little you know, toolbox and, and a girl should always have a toolbox. So what I do is, that, uh, you know, with every renovation, I just make sure, well, when I'm starting a renovation, I'll just pack everything, like a whole truckload of stuff up, and I just move it to the next site. So it just has all my basic tools, like my spanners, my screwdrivers, um, just all sorts of things. I couldn't get it open, um, closed. So just, you know, anything that you're going to need, spanners, chisels, you name it, um, you know, spare gloves, whatever. So I just make sure I have this, because quite often as a project manager, you'll be walking through your site, and it could be the tiniest little thing. It could be like a little nail from the floorboard that's just come loose. You just quickly grab your hammer, bang, 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 the problem is solved. Okay, so 10 ways to establish. So that's all you need to do to establish a site. So if you do the temporary fencing, the port loo the site safety signage, the first aid kit, your little disposable items, your project management desk, you do all of that, you're going to be sweet, okay? You're ready to start work. Now, I had, a, I had an instance um, on my January cosmetic renovation. On the very first day I started work on that site, I was about three hours into the site, and um, I had the ranger out on site. So the neighbour, one of the neighbours just took it upon themselves to ring up and say, oh, they've got all these workers, that, you know, they've started this renovation next door, all these workers, they're all unlicensed. So it's just some, some silly person rang up, none of them have got green cards. So the council ranger came out literally at lunchtime and he said, Look, we've had a report that you've got unlicensed workers here. And I said, that's ridiculous. I've done all my site inductions. He actually said to me, um, even at the very, he goes, I doubt that you um, are going to have, like, you know, I doubt that. But he goes, from the way that you have set your sites up, I can see you've done everything professionally here. So needless to say, he went through and he checked everybody's white cards and everybody had white cards. It's just sometimes you'll deal with some idiots. Um, people get very jealous too when you get in and renovate and you start to transform a house, you know, the tall poppy syndrome. So expect that sort of stuff. If you have all your site establishment in place um, and you look like you've been, you tried to do the right thing, the ranges are going to come down a lot easier on you, okay? You won't get as much trouble. It's when you blatantly flout the law that they don't like you and come down heavy. Okay, I'm going to teach you 10 ways to establish a trade team. Basically, first way, easiest way, word of mouth. If you know of anybody that's had any good experiences with tradies, certainly build those, get, find out who those tradies are and put them into your trade directory. Um, keep an eye out for trade utes everywhere. So um, what you need to do is when you're at the supermarket now and you, know, you pull up and you see a, a painting van parked in the car park, write the phone number down and basically put it into your trade directory. And this is good to do this in your local area because the reality is they either live there or they're working there, they're in that area at the moment. So try and keep an eye out for trade utes everywhere. 
Um, the best time to, to get phone numbers is actually during, um, sorry, the best time to get phone numbers is actually if you take a drive between 6 to 7 a.m. in the morning or 3 to 4 p.m. in the afternoon. That's when tradies are going to work and that's when tradies are leaving sites. So if you um, are aware of this, you'll see that the whole, um, the whole roads are chock-a-block full of trade utes, trade trucks at that point in time. Okay, visit local building sites. A lot of um, great way to get tradies is actually just to go around to your local suburb and see what building sites are under construction. So in literally every suburb that you go to, there's always a construction site, at least one construction site on the go at one time. So a lot of um, tradies actually hang their signs on the temporary fencing. Have you ever seen that? Okay, the reality is a builder or a project manager is never going to let a bad, bad tradesperson hang their sign on the fence. I've had requests from tradespeople that I didn't think their work was particularly good. Um, if I didn't want to offend them, I'd have actually said, yep, yeah, you know, hang your sign on the fence. And as soon as they've gone, I've taken it down, okay? So any trade person that generally does good work, a project manager or builder will be more than happy to let them hang their sign on the fence. So certainly do that. Um, get, the, get your details from there or go up and just basically yell out on the site, like go to the building site and call out for the building manager. So don't ever walk on somebody's building site if, you're going to, if you want to try and get some trade details. Just go to their front of their gate and just say, hello, hello, is anybody there? And normally some tradie will come out or the builder will come out and just say, I'm sorry to disturb you. Look, I'm looking for a good electrician, good sparky in the area. Have you got anybody in your contact list that I could potentially use? That's another great way to get good trades people that a lot of people overlook. Um, also, building material suppliers. So, um, look, don't go to Bunnings and try and get the details of local tradies because they wouldn't have a clue who their customers are. But there are a lot of still in small independent hardware stores around that basically um, have customers, very loyal customers, builders who go and tradies that go to that one particular store. As a tradie, you'll either shop at Bunnings or you'll shop at those small independent stores. You'll either typically go one way. So those small independent hardware stores, and you see them all around still, they, have, they know who their customers are. They know that Mark's a plumber. Um, they know all sorts of things, and they know these people on a first-name basis. So you can go into the staff of those stores and say, look, I'm looking for a good plumber. Can you tell me, is there anybody that comes in here that you can recommend? So that's another great way. Trade classifieds in your local newspaper. Look, if you're doing a quick cosmetic renovation, your local paper is an absolutely great way to get a lot of tradies. I use a lot of tradies consistently. The renovation that I did out in Penrith uh, in, uh, in January, I had to use all new tradies because my city tradies just didn't want to travel an hour out of the city. So it meant that I had to source a lot of tradies from the newspaper. So getting tradies from your local newspaper is absolutely no issue, but you need to make sure that you do your due diligence on them. So you definitely want to be um, checking their work and more importantly, you want to be making sure they are truly licensed. There are some tradies who copy or quote the license number of other tradies. So they'll just look in the paper and they'll pull a number and they'll actually quote that number as their own because nobody, most consumers don't ever think to ask. So when you go out and you say, you know, when Beryl or whatever goes, are you licensed? And they go, yes, I'm licensed. Do you need my license number? And um, they go, oh, no, that's fine. As long as you're licensed, that's fine. So people never follow through with actually checking it. A lot of tradies in the paper also don't have insurance. They say you will have ins they have insurance. And when crunch, you know, the crunch time comes, you say, where's your insurance policy? Oh, I, I can't find it. Or, oh, I just, just discovered that it expired three months ago. Funny, they'll just say better. You know, that's, and I've heard that so many times. And I have a higher incidence of tradies from the local paper that I'm dealing with that situation where they're not licensed or they're not got proper insurance. So you have to make sure you check that before you, uh, you let them on your site. And that's part of your site induction process, which I'll go through shortly. Now, do you think your, your consultants, you know, your professional design team, your structural engineers, your hydraulic engineers, your architect, your interior designers, do you think they may have some good tradies at their disposal? Yeah. Yep, absolutely. I could ring my hydraulic engineer now and basically, you know, get 10 phone numbers of 10 very good plumbers if I wanted to. I don't need to because I've already got a great plumber. Hi, Mark and Maroon. Um, but um, yeah, you know, you can also lean on your consultants and say, look, can you give me some phone numbers of any, any guys that you've worked with in the, in the planning process? Okay, Yellow Pages. Um, yellow Pages is another great way to source tradies. Um, not so much little individual tradies like carpenters and things like 
like that. But basically, the sort of tradies that I get from the yellow pages are more service tradies like concrete cutters, um, pool installers, that sort of stuff. So make sure as part of your setup process, make sure you have a copy of the yellow pages A to K, L to Z on your construction site. Because particularly when it comes time to shopping for your materials, um, very quick and easy just to quickly go through the yellow pages. All right, tradie referrals. Um, quite a lot of the time, you might get tradies that will be on site and they'll come up to you and say, Cherie, do you need like some form workers for this project or do you need, do you need some tilers or whatever? And you'll think, well, wow, they're being really nice and friendly. They're being helpful. But really, they may be getting a silent kickback. Okay, so a lot of tradies, um, if they refer them to another tradie, quite often a lot of tradies will get some sort of kickback. And it can be like a percentage of the invoice, like 50 bucks or 100 bucks, or it could be even a simple thing as just a slab of beer. So just be careful of that because they may not be necessarily referring a tradie to you that's truly good. All right, there's also industry association websites, so things like HIA, Master Builders Association. You can also find a lot of tradies in that regard. Also, you can do Google search as well. So Google search, type in Carpenter, Balmain, whatever it may be, and you'll get a lot of tradies that way. The type of companies that you want to avoid for your trade team, establishing your trade team, you know those companies where you can ring up and they organize all the quotes for you? They're for weekend warriors, warriors. They're not for professional renovators, okay? At the end of the day, there is still a loaded commission built into those quotes, okay? And that's a commission I'd rather in your pocket as profit, not in the pocket of somebody else. So avoid using those companies at all expenses. I'm gonna get my tradies up so I can let them out early. So let's welcome Mark and Maroon to the stage. come from the job, yeah. they're real tradies. Yeah. So what I thought guys is that, um, obviously I'm gonna talk now about, don't be bashful, come over. <laughs> um, so basically I thought I'd get just a couple of tradies that I work with, um, this is your opportunity to ask them anything you want about me or what I do, <laughs> uh, secrets. Um, so basically I thought I'd bring them in just to basically, um, I guess, find out what the needs of tradies are because the reality is, you know, we have needs as professional renovators, we know what we want to do, but also tradies have needs. So I guess I'm probably bringing these guys on stage to talk about the ways that you can have really good relationships with professional renovators, people such as myself, and all of these guys who are wanting to become professional renovators. So I guess, what are the essential things that a tradie wants? When they're dealing with a professional renovator, or these people who want to establish a long-term relationship with you, what are the things that you want uh, that are important to you as a tradie? And be truthful. Oh. Um, <laughs> well, personally, I, I like you know, go into a job that's, you know, in good nick, it's not dirty and stuff like that. You, you go to a job that's as fully established, like you've been talking about since I've been listening. Yep. All them factors, you know, you go somewhere and you see how it, how it looks. The first thing you see is how it looks and you just think the person you're dealing with is the person in charge of this site. Yep. What are they? That's what they're like, you know what yep. I mean? They're so you sort of, you, in, 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 unfortunately, you do take a bit of a, a role as what the site's like is what you're like as a renovator. So yep. if you can stay on the ball with how things are looking first impression, that's what I found. And then two, um, secondly, is that, you know, you create a good relationship with them, like you said, friendly. It, just everything rolls a lot smoother in yeah. everything. So I'm very big on side of trying to, you know, just the little refreshments and, you know, water and, you know, I, you know I've spoken to you many times if, about how I buy coffees for my tradies when I can. So, I mean, how important are those things? I mean, are they important or am I just wasting my money? Uh, they're probably not really important for, for us, yep. but you notice them and that's the, well, it's everything. So you notice about, them? Yeah, so what does them. that make you do for me yeah, then? Yeah, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, you know, you give, you're given someone a guarantee with your work. So, I mean, there's one respect you get paid and you, you go home. There's another respect you don't want to let someone down either. So, I mean, you can establish a rapport with someone like that. I mean, it's only going to benefit yourself in the long run, I, yeah. I guess. You know. So that, so that like, because uh, I know like an instance where recently what you like a, um, <laughs> a bacon and egg roll yeah, or right, something. Yeah. yeah, on site. So I'll start. Uh, you're stoked? <laughs> See the power of a piece of bacon. <laughs> okay, um, I guess to most people, I guess you deal with a lot of clients. Obviously, I'm not your only client, but you deal with a lot of clients and do most builders, renovators, 
pay attention to the small little details like that, buying cups of coffee, you know, bacon and egg roll here and there, whatever it may be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, or not. For me, I, I do those things to try and foster relationships because, you know, at yeah. the end of the day, I'm fairly tough on, not tough, but I know what I want on site. And I guess sometimes the tea and the coffee is just a little way to show my softer side, would you <laughs> and say? Juice. And juice. And juice? <laughs> yeah, I still remember the juice when we were in the... Um, Somewhere in your sister place. I don't remember yeah. exactly where the place is. Uh, it's a pleasure to work with um, Cherie. She knows exactly what she wants. She click, she's quick, and she's 100% online. So no mistakes, and that's the most important thing. You get in, you do your job, you get out, pay, everything in place, no problems at all. And that's what makes everybody um, happy, yeah. and everybody is satisfied. Satisfaction is a guarantee 100%. There is no mistakes, because she knows exactly what's what she's ordering and what she wants. So everything will go in place from A to Z. No one is, never, never, no one is unsatisfied. They're always satisfied. <laughs> <laughs> she said, yeah, run for president. <laughs> um, so, okay, and uh, in terms of what are the essential things for you as tradies? Like, what is the most, being a tradie, what are some of the things you hate being about a tradie? I guess working, not all builders, renovators are the same. So what is the easiest way for these people to cheese you off and for you to do the wrong thing by them? Um, oh. First thing comes <laughs> out of toilet paper. Was that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's no toilet paper to take home. Um, no, probably at the moment I'm doing a job and um, the it's for a church and the, the the project manager who I'm guessing puts uh, he's got a figure for the whole job that he takes he he subbies the work out to us and he's he gave me the spiel at the start of the job that it's for a church look after the church you know what I mean it's 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 gonna it's gonna look like a, a donation by doing a cheaper price you know what I mean but at the end of the day like he's tried to haggle me down to a figure you know you can you you're always within reason for something but the way the way he was. The way he was, yeah, it was pretty offensive where, what he wanted to offer to do the work. So that, yeah. I found that, you know, that straight away you just... That he was trying to just like get you yeah, down Yeah, yeah, lost, so sharpen low. the pencil too much. You know what I mean? You've got to cover your, your bases a, a bit where if the project yeah. goes a bit longer. So uh, that meant that if I wasn't on the money in everything I'd done, I was yeah. going to lose money. So, you know... Yeah, and you want to get into a situation, look, you can, you can try and haggle and haggle and haggle and you don't really want to do that because at the end of the day, like, you guys don't work for free, do you? So why would you expect other people to work for free? And I know you probably hate me because I'm always, like, haggling with you <laughs> on my kitchen cabinets. But, you know, at the end of the day, you've got to leave something in the deal for them. Otherwise, they're not going to um, want to work for you. Uh, the most important thing is uh, the client to know exactly what he wants. So uh, let's say he got a little project in his hands or, let's say, plan. Or I want this, I want this, I want that. And we can, you know, we can consider the situation and we can talk together about it. So, which is, which is good, which is bad. So I always advise my clients uh, which way to be done. Sometimes, you know, they got the idea, but they don't know how to put it on the floor, how to, uh, to get it done. So together, always we work to get the stuff in place and just in a particular time, and not, as we're saying, to stretch your time and we'll be the ending up with fighting or, let's say, no one is satisfied, we don't like this way. We always work, let's say, from A to Z, everything in place, everything in detail joinery is very, very important to work. We work in the mill. We don't work in a centimeter or in a, in, the, um, on, in a fraction here or there. It doesn't work this way. When we put everything in place, everything goes in place, and, and that's it. So you don't have to even adjust doors or do things here and there. That's why the most important thing is the project, when it's ready, we start it from there, and let's say there is particular time, five days, a week, two days, two weeks, and we work it out that way. And so far, so good. Okay, cool. So what would you say then, tips for these guys? How can, how can they get their tradies to love them? Um, the communication is very important, to be honest, actually, and tell exactly what they like and what they don't. So that's from where we started. I like this, I like this, I like that, I like that. I don't like this one, I like this one. And at the same time, we can work together to, uh, to create something that's more better and looks nicer. That's, that's, the, um, that's the kind of work we do all the time. Okay, cool. And I guess for you, Mark, like your, your work is definitely not aesthetic, being a plumber. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so I guess wh what is it that... Uh, what, I guess if you, if, you look, if you use me as an example, what are the... I hope you... Do you like working with me? Yeah. Oh, good. We just, I thought I'd check that first. Or I better not assume that. <laughs> so what, what is it about me that makes you like working on my sites? 
Um, I mean, it's everything. It's like, like Besides the fact that I'm hot. Oh, yeah. Right? yeah I'm joking. <laughs> oh, well, then there's nothing other than that. Nobody so. tells me that these days. <laughs> No, 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 no. It's a, it is everything. There's, I'm joking. Yeah, Nobody you, tells me a whole lot to tell myself. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, you get onto the job, and, you, and from day dot, there's a plan on, you know, not, not only a plan on what work there's to be done, there's a schedule on how fast that work's going to be done as well. So yep. you, you, you can sort of, that's what I like personally. I like scheduling my work at, at least a week in front of myself, at, at, at least a couple of days, say. So, so um, you, you get on site, and you've got a, a plan, a schedule, and when, when things are happening, you know, a, a plan to read from the, the work that you're doing. Yep. And, and you find that, um, obviously, you know the work that you're doing in the next coming, coming amount of days, and you also know where you're going to be. You're going to schedule other jobs in that time as well. So, you know, an itinerary of what, what's, where the job's going to be at in a certain time, you know, that sort of stuff seems to flow pretty well with yourself. So, yeah. you know. And, and that's a big problem. Like, a lot of renovators, they don't actually have the construction project plan. So quite often, they're just winging it by day by day. And what it does is when you're winging it, then it sort of gives some uncertainty to these guys. I mean, they're business people too. They, they want to get in and out of the deal, out of the project as quickly as possible, like all of you want to. And it helps them, like, factor, work out their time. You know, if Mark knows that he's got to be on my site Tuesday and Wednesday and he's not going to be on site on Thursday at least it gives him the ability to then plan other work for Thursday so he's not going one day on work one day off work one day on one day off do you know what I mean so when you are more going to organize your trades will like working with you in that regard because then they can keep consistent income coming through on their end as well any other questions that you would like to ask my tradies while while they're here this is your time honest questions yes <laughs> okay, I'll give that to you in a second. How do you get a woman to take you seriously, project managing? Yeah, that's a fair, that's a fair point. Yeah. How do you get a woman to take you seriously? No, no, how, how, do you, how do you take you, a woman? How do you get you to take a woman? Yeah, I know what you're saying. You've, yeah. probably, you've pretty much taken the first step. You come to, to learn from a woman, so you're following something that's proven, you know. Sure, he hasn't really got here today doing it the wrong way, so, you know, everyone takes you serious, so just... That's the first step so that I, guess, that I, I guess, say. Yeah, follow I guess follow the everything point is, you learn. Uh, at the moment, these guys haven't got my experience or my track record, so they're going to be coming in. Uh, yeah. For example, so what's your name? Fiona. Fiona. So let's Fiona. It's her first renovation, yep. and you come out to Fiona's site. You don't know who she is from a bar of soap. Yeah. You know, how would you, would you necessarily give, would you assume Fiona's a ding-a-ling, or would you assume <laughs> that... Um, without sounding, without sounding you know, sexist, might be a lot of people's first opinion until... Your, your Fiona's probably going to be prepared, so you're going to get to site. You're going to know, you know, you're going to know what you want. You're going to know the ins and outs stuff that I wouldn't know. I'm a plumber. I don't know stuff to do with you know cabinetry and you know electrical stuff. And if you've got an idea of the sort of LED lights that you want and this and that, you know, someone's straight away going to take your opinion and know that you know what you're talking about. So if you have a sort of a, if you, even each person that came, was to come on your site, if you were to know what you need to ask and what. You know, and, and a few like short lines that make them think, oh, she knows what she's talking about. That's that's straight away the first thing you know. And you're going to find a lot of people. You, you'll sort of look, you'll um, work a lot of people out at the start doing that too, because people that will hear a woman and come out and take take a bit of an advantage with price wise and this and that. If you know what you're talking about, um, you know you're going to you're going to sort a few people out straight away. They get the serious workers out there, you know. That's and the, rea the reality is, you're not going to know about those things to start off with but if you actually look organized and this is where all these little things like your project management desk your laptop uh, your, your tools your cases your you know your artist case the, all those sort of things can make you look the part when you so it's almost like faking it until you make it yeah, that's right. yeah. so do, would you believe that yeah, if like you saw definitely. a chick with all this like yeah. personal organization yeah, exactly you're right. gonna just assume that she's not totally docile yeah, exactly and right. she's gonna, well, you're gonna be half foot in the door sort of so to speak yeah. and the reality is like to this day I still don't know a lot about construction like there will be builders in this room that have better construction like heaps better construction knowledge but that's not my job my job is to project manage not be an expert in construction so don't think it's always the essential ingredient all right now I'm going to give everybody does anybody want these these tradies uh, phone numbers yeah okay so now last time I did this they were booked out for a year on um, my other ones so Mark so Mark is awesome <laughs> <laughs> Kickbacks? Oh, yeah. I didn't think about that. <laughs> yeah, Let's talk. No. All right. Let's talk about that later. Um, right? 04. 24. Yep. Double seven. Double seven. Double five. Yep. Zero nine. Okay. <laughs> but she knew that. I was just, just, just so she didn't get it in <laughs>
<laughs> now, Mark, Mark's actually just um, quit his job, his job with his employer, and he's actually just started That's his right, own yeah. business. So, yeah. And he's going Thank well. You. Now, Maroon. So, Maroon's my cabinet maker. Maroon is going to become all of your new best friends. Um, <laughs> and I said you would look after all our renovating for profit for graduates, sure. won't for you? Sure. So, Maroon. All four. All one. Yep. All right. Five double two. Yep. Five oh seven. Five oh seven. And you only do cabinetry for New South Wales? Um, I think it's enough. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> Good question. Good answer. That would keep me busy for a while. Okay, cool. All right, so I'll leave those numbers up there. So, Mark for plumbing. Uh, the company sure. name, Mark Water Plumbing. Mark Water Plumbing. I'll leave some cards at the back, by the way, as well. Yep. So feel free to grab one. And Maroon, what's your company now? I just know you oh, guys are M&R Maroon. Kitchen Design. M&R. M&R Kitchen Design. Okay, M&R Kitchen Design. So Maroon can do your wardrobes, your cabinets, your storage cabinets, shop bathroom, fitting, shop fitting. Genre. Yeah, and beautiful work. Ah, oh, thank you. <laughs> and he'll do a very good price for you. Not a haggly price, but a very good <laughs> price, okay? <laughs> it's a pleasure to work with you anyway. Oh, We've been, you. I've been through... Um, five six jobs so far in and out and that's it everything perfect everything in place and no hiccups that's the most important thing yeah thank you guys I appreciate right, so you coming in Thanks. Thanks. Room. question up the back there oh, hello i just wanted to um see what areas of sydney they would go to like i presume you they go, they go all over yeah. everywhere yeah, all, all over yeah they'll go yeah. anywhere all Excellent. Thanks. anywhere newcastle and the gong all over there you go